हैं
morning, everyone. I think we can get started now. Students who are just walking in, please uh, grab the seats that are at the end. And I think there are some few seats here at the front as well. Please quietly walk up and take your seats. All right. A very warm welcome to all of you. It's indeed a matter of honor and pleasure to have with us today Dr. K. Vijay Raghavan, who is here to deliver the first PK Parija lecture series in life sciences. So Without much ado, I'll just take a couple of minutes to tell you about Professor P.K. Parija and why we all are here. So I'm sure as you all walked in, you've seen the notes that are there on the poster board. And I'm sure I noticed some of the students reading that up yesterday. So Professor Parija happens to be, um, you must have read up, uh, an OBE, an officer of the British Empire. And he's worked here in Odisha, he's been associated with some of the top universities, not just in India, but also worldwide. He spent um, about eight years at the Cambridge University, trying to get experience in plant physiology. Came back to India, was associated with Ravenshaw University, and had been instrumental in setting up the Uttal University in Katak, which later, now you know that it's in Bhubaneswar. And as I said earlier, that he is a remarkable scientist, he was, sorry, a remarkable scientist in the area of plant physiology, and quite um, a visionary who had already started working on concepts such as bioremediation. In fact, his last work was on working on water hyacinths. So I would now request Adeen R&D, Dr. Vishwas Chavan, to kindly welcome our guest of honor, who is here to deliver the special lecture. Thank you, uh, Selvi, and good, uh, good morning to each one of you. It's indeed a great pleasure to introduce a man who actually does not need an introduction, a stalwart in the area of uh, developmental biology, genetics, neurogenetics, um, Padmashri Professor K. Vijay Raghavan, did his B.Tech and M.Tech in chemical engineering from IIT Kanpur, Ph.D. from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He spent uh, some of his time as a senior research fellow at the California Institute of Technology in the United States, uh, winner of the Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology that is given by CSIR in 1988. Uh, he joined uh, CIFR at 1988, later on moved on to uh, National Center for Biological Sciences at Bangalore. Uh, in 1999, he was given an honorary faculty at JNCAR, uh, recipient of a J.C. Bose Fellowship, Infosys Award in Life Sciences, uh, TWAS Fellow, Fellow of the Royal Society, uh, awardee of the H.K. Pirodia Award. He has been the secretary to the Department of Biotechnology during 2013-2018. He was conferred uh, the Civilian Award Padma Shri in 2013. In 2014, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan was elected as the Foreign Associate of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. During 2018, to 2022, which covers the crucial period of uh, pandemic one, pandemic two, uh, Professor uh, Vijay Raghavan led this nation in developing the vaccine for the pandemic uh, in his role as the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. Currently, he is an emeritus professor at NCBS, Bangalore. Uh, it is my great pleasure to present your man of Indian science, 
प्रोफेसर के विजय राघवन सिंह Thank you very very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here, and thank you for that generous uh, introduction. As you can see, my talk is next month. Um, let me just correct the date over there. Good. Now we're back to today. Oh, today sorry, <laughs> even worse. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you very much again, and it's a um, you know particular privilege to talk at this P.K. Pariga lecture. And as you heard from Dr. Selvi, he is a remarkable man, and the way he lived his life and what he did for both uh, research as well as for the community. And it's particularly remarkable to have someone to leave, um, you know whatever little wealth academics have to continue education, teaching, and research. So um, these are the kind of people which uh, really are worth emulating. I would also like to thank Aisar uh, Bairampur for having me here. Um, I had uh, known your you know, late director, Professor Chari, quite well when he was at PIFR, and it's a particular sudden and sad loss to have him go. Um, it's good to see that the campus which all of you and he are helping build coming up so well and uh, your director, Dr. Yogendra Sharma and others, I'm sure will take it through these times and build a great institution. Um, institutions at this time are in their lives are very um, exciting as well as difficult. Uh, and as you go through these times, it's a very important learning experience, and you will remember it very well. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Professor uh, Vedanga Mohanty from NYSER for initiating this and having me uh, give this talk here today and at NYSER later in the afternoon. So what I would like to talk about is how inherited mechanisms um, in our bodies, which we get from our parents, and also our environment shape the way we are built. Uh, it is rather remarkable when we look at the enormous diversity of life on Earth, uh, the huge variations that we see. And yet, the progeny of specific species still by and large remain the same species. A certain mango tree gives rise to another mango tree through a process. Dogs give birth to dogs, chimpanzees to chimpanzees, humans to humans. How then do you have a situation where you have this fidelity in reproduction on one side by and large and this variation which you see which generates species? And this was a kind of question which intrigued many people and for which we have really important breakthroughs over the last few hundred years about how these kinds of things happen. And more recently in the last couple of decades, there have been even greater technological breakthroughs which allow us to address this question in greater detail. So that's the point which I'd like to uh, address here in this talk. Now to understand how we are built, uh, we must keep in mind that we need to understand uh, where we come from. There are still some people at outside over there. There are lots of empty chairs over here, so those who want to come can come in. I think some others are wisely going away. Uh, good. understand how we are built, we need to also know where we come from. And really, if you ask the kinds of questions 
which biologists are, they fall into three categories. And these three categories of questions are simple. One is, where do we come from? And that is the science of evolution. The second is, how do we, how are we made? And that's what I'll be talking about. That's developmental biology. And the third is, how do we function? And that's physiology. So these are the only three questions, no matter what biologists do, they keep asking again and again. Of course, when things go wrong and need to be fixed, that's the engineering part of it, and that's medicine. And all of this is very important for medicine. Now, the Earth came about about you know, 4.5 billion years ago. And amazingly, about a billion years after that, we started having life on Earth coming about. So it took about a billion years after the formation of the Earth for life to start. And early organisms were, at first approximation for our conversation here, were essentially unicellular organisms. So if you look at this as the wall of origin of life, that was populated by unicellular organisms. And still, the huge diversity of organisms which we see on Earth is still unicellular organisms. So from 3.5 billion years to now, as we go on, we had multicellular organisms of various kinds, we had plants, animals, and the diversification of plants and animals, and so on and so forth. So much of our understanding of how all of that came about came from one of the world's greatest big data scientists, two of them, who really, what they did, Darwin and Wallace, Darwin by going around the world and Wallace essentially in the Malay archipelago, looked at the diversity of life forms and reasoned that life on Earth came about not just by evolution. Many people had ideas that life evolved because you know that you look at a small lizard in your house or a large lizard at the Galapagos, you feel that yes, these things are related. But what Darwin and Wallace proposed was evolution through natural selection. And this was a major breakthrough, and it was observational, looking at data in a big way and deciphering what could be the principles behind it. So this is an extraordinary amount of big data work. Now let us go through how this happened with some speed. Uh, it's going to be in the slide. So as I said, about 2.5 to 3.8 billion years ago, there were simple cells. And then there was photosynthesis, and that was a remarkable change. And then we had complex cells, what are called eukaryotes, cells which have a nucleus inside which there, are genetic, there is a genetic material. And multicellular organisms then were started to be seen. Now each of this is a major set of lectures in biology, but this, you can see how life was changing. Now, for many years, for about 600 million years, there were simple animals. Then, about 570 million years ago, there was a huge burst in terms of the arthropods, uh, ancestors of insects, arachnids, and crustaceans. And about 550 million years ago, there was an enormous burst of complex animals. And these explosions of diversity are remarkable, and we still don't understand how some rather simple organisms, which are essentially cubes, you had these extraordinary diversity of form coming about. There is one view which many evolutionary biologists have that these diversifications were adaptations to the environment. And there's another view which some philosophers and scientists have that the physical and geographical and other mechanical forces constrained evolution in a manner which allowed these kinds of forms to come about. That again is a topic for you know, uh, study. And we had about 400 um, and 75 million years of land plants and with insects and seeds coming about 400 million years ago. Flowering plants came about only 130 million years ago. So you imagine from 4.5 billion years we have come to, you know, 130 million years. Now then something amazing happened. 
So there were these large mammals around, uh, sorry, small mammals around, reptiles, dinosaurs, and 65 million years ago, something extraordinary happened. A big or moderate-sized asteroid struck the Earth in Mexico, what is now Mexico, and that resulted in the complete collapse of non-avian dinosaurs in a huge way. So this is a dramatic effect, and this allowed the mammalian radiation, which was then a very niche radiation, constrained by other restrictions in the environment, to start expanding. And it's about 2.5 million years since the appearance of Homo, and 200,000 years since the appearance of modern humans, and only 25,000 years since Neanderthals, who we are related to, uh, and whose genes still are there in our genes, uh, 20, 25,000 years ago since they were developed. So this is the evolutionary history, um, very rapidly given, of how life forms evolved on this planet. Now, human dominating life on this planet has meant many things. First of all, with our ability to hold opposed thumb and forefinger, we could make tools. Our ability for speech and language and the corresponding development and evolution of our brains allowed the processing of external information in a manner which no other animal, no other primate could do. This resulted in the development of language and culture and cultural revolution and the evolution through language and the evolution by making prosthetic tools of various kinds, the printing press, the computer and so on, uh, machines, manufacturing, has completely changed the world. So humans have moved and you know, from being able to manage to survive on this planet to being the people who have started changing the planet rather dramatically. Now this is an extraordinary change and this allows us to not only you know, survive on this planet, but to sit here and understand nature and inquire about nature's engineering. And while simultaneously becoming engineers of nature, we have changed the planet beyond recognition. So we have going forward an enormous responsibility, not just to understand the planet, not just to understand the universe, but to actually rescue our planet back. And that's another topic for another lecture which we have. So in understanding the world around us, one aspect which humans often ask is how are we made from what we now know to be a fertilized egg? And fertilization and the development from the embryo was a big mystery. Humans understood that just like with a frog or with a newt or salamander whose embryonic development you could see from the outside, humans also must develop in the womb in a similar manner, in a manner which later people found the mouse, for example, developed. So, but how is it from a fertilized egg that you make an organism, an animal, which has got all these extraordinary complexities and diversities in people? That was the big question. So, how do you go from here on the left, an embryo, uh, a fertilized egg, to a human embryo, and then to an adult? Now, this question was answered by, was addressed by many embryologists in a very simple manner. Uh, and this kind of experiment, which we still do in a more sophisticated way, were rather simple. One would be to take an organism when from one cell it has gone to a two-cell state. So it's a two-cell organism. And then if you kill one cell, you can ask whether the second cell makes half an organism or makes an entire organism. So there was one theory that cells as they divide partition components to their daughter cells so that you have one cell receiving some of this component and the other cell receiving other components. And this was a set of rules which said this side shall become one half and that side shall become the other half and so on, quarters and so on. So if this were true, then 
ablation, killing one cell would result in a half organ. And this, this is what Willem Roos found. When he took a frog embryo and he killed one cell, he found that the other cell made half an organ. So this mechanistic view of development was something which excited many people and they decided that they solved the mystery of development. That development should took place by partitioning at finer and finer level components which were ruled about what cells could differentiate into and what tissues they could make. What those components were, they didn't know. But a colleague, a contemporary, Hans Drew, did another experiment. And in science, you always, you know, uh, repeat experiments. And you repeat them in different ways, in different contexts, to test the hypothesis. So Drew took a two-cell embryo of a sea urchin, and he took a fine hair from his eyelash, and then he tied a knot and separated these two cells. Now, these two cells were not stuck to each other, like with Willem Roos experiment, but they were separate from each other. And he thought that when he would come back the next day, he would find three half animals developed. But what he found was something extraordinary. In many of the cases, each cell made an entire organ, not just half an organ. Somehow, these cells knew that they were no longer in contact with another cell and decided that they would make an entire organ. But this basically threw out of the door this idea of asymmetric division of components to make animals. So Drew's man was extremely shaken by this. Uh, he could not think of a material explanation for this and therefore left science, left biology uh, and went into philosophy and religion. So doing biology can be dangerous. Now, the answers for these kinds of questions came by several workers who showed that contact was something which inhibited one cell from becoming another kind and so on. But a beautiful experiment by Hans Schumann and Hilde Mangold came over here. And Hans Schumann, Hilde Mangold was Hans Schumann's um, technician. Man, um, Schumann got the Nobel Prize for his work and Mangold unfortunately died when she was 25 years in a kitchen accident. And here is Eddie de Robotis at the University of California at Los Angeles repeating the Mangold Schumann experiment. So you take from one embryo, one piece of the embryo, and you, you can put it, take a piece from here and put it somewhere else in another embryo, like it's being done over here. Now, if this piece were to form some structures, if you put it over there, it will still form the same structure. But what Schumann and Mangold found was something extraordinary, that this little piece put into another location resulted in an entire axis of development of the animal developing at the new location. So somehow this piece, he and Hilde Mangold inferred, that this piece sitting here was promoting the development of a large region. And if you took it and put it somewhere else, it would promote the development of that region elsewhere. So there was a long range signaling mechanism which was taking place. And this is the kind of simple experiment which didn't tell you anything about what mechanism inside was happening, but with these kinds of experiments from Ruse and Drews and from um, Schumann and Mangold and several others, you could infer how from an embryo you're making a animal. So the idea was that somehow what was happening is that cells, when they divide, they communicate at short range and long range like this, and that regulates the development of different cells on which they act. But how does this happen? Those kinds of mechanistic hypotheses of how it happened fell into multiple categories. There were people such as Goldschmidt shown over here. Goldschmidt was a proponent of the idea that it is 
the nucleus, which is very, very important, and the genetic material or some material in the nucleus, which is important, in a manner similar to what Willem Yu said. So he argued that there were factors which are being distributed, and they determined what happened. So he was a very strong proponent of there being a distribution of material from the two daughter cells and how that happened. And this is Duff. He was an American um, biologist. And he felt that the membrane of the cell was critically important, and somehow that was communicating from one to another. And others felt that between the nucleus and the member, uh, membrane, the cytoplasm was important. So there are very heated debates on that. And it was also a time for intense politics. This was, you know, Europe before the Second World War and after the Second World War uh, in that period. And uh, Goldsmith, uh, Goldsmith went from Europe to America. And he said that in six months of staying in America, he found more independence and freedom as a Jew than he found in Europe. Duff, on the other hand, emigrated from America to Europe and said that in six months in Europe, he found more freedom and you know, um, more liberty than he found in an entire lifetime in America. So these are the kinds of conflicts which were going on at that time. But basically, this was a group of embryologists who are trying to understand by ablating and putting tissue from one place to another, the rules which govern how animals develop and inferring about what that happened. Now, in parallel, there was another major discipline of biology which was happening, which didn't communicate with developmental biology. So embryology, as it's then called, a developmental biology, was a field where you try to understand how embryos develop to give animal form in particular. There was a lot of work on plants, which I'm not talking about. But in the early 20th century, the work of Gregor Mendel on seeds, how variation in the kind from generation to generation of seeds could help him understand what the rules of inheritance. And the early 20th century was a period when there was a dramatic increase in research which showed that these rules were general and applied to all organisms in one way or the other. Basically, there were ways by which characters of what we see from the outside, they were called characters, I, the color of the eyes, the color of the hair, color of skin, um, wing shape and fruit flies, uh, characters of plants, how they were inherited from generation to generation, what were the rules was something very important. Now these rules really told you how when you have a character which, for example, you see in one generation, you cross it to another plant which doesn't have that character, the next generation shows perfectly normal plants, and the generation after that again shows the character again. So there was this phenomenon of these characters appearing and disappearing, and this too led many people to suspect that you could not find a material basis for genetics, and there was a mystical metaphor which these characters appeared in the organism and disappeared. Now that was disproven by beautiful experiments by Thomas Hunt Morgan and others, who showed that in the fruit fly polyteen chromosome, which you could see, that because of X-rays which changed the organization of the chromosome, and that correlated with characters, led Morgan and others to propose that these characters were resident inside the nucleus of the cell. So the characters which control, the, the mechanisms which control the nature of outside characters material properties which were there inside the cell. And that led to an extraordinary search for what this was by several others, many biochemists, and they showed that the genetic material, um, DNA had been discovered earlier, but they showed that the genetic material was nucleic acid of DNA. And this was done by a very beautiful experiment uh, by in which um, Avery, McLeod, and McCarthy um, took information from a drain inspector in London who looked at bacterial pathogenesis. There were pathogenic bacteria and non-pathogenic bacteria and showed that one could may be made pathogenic by transforming, by transforming them with extracts from 
a non, uh, from a pathogenic one to a non-pathogenic. So there was something in the cell, in the material, which could change one kind of bacterium to another. And Avery McLeod and McCarty at the Rockefeller University showed that this was DNA. So DNA was shown to be the genetic material. Mendel had shown how the rules work by which the genetic material gives rise to characteristics. Mendel and Morgan and others. So it should have been a very exciting time for the acceptance of DNA as a genetic material and the linking between genetics and development is very slow. Then there came about a extraordinary uh, revolution in which Watson and Crick and Morris Wilton and very interestingly Rosalind Franklin, it's very important history which you should all read about. They discovered the structure of the genetic material of DNA. And this led to an understanding from the structure of how genes could regulate the expression of proteins and how that could result in cellular components. Now, all of this needed to come together. You had from genetics a description of what had happened in outside characteristics. In embryology, you had a description of how potentially what the theories were by which an embryo could give rise to an animal. But somehow you needed to link these two together. And that didn't happen for a long time until people started studying substantially this animal. That's the fruit fly to Sotlamagnus. And while this was extraordinarily valuable in showing how eye color, wing, and so on, and understanding genetics, major breakthroughs came when Edward Lewis, Danny Nussbein Pollard, and Eric Wieschaus started asking what genes in the organism should we mutate so that the patterning of head, thorax, and abdomen are affected? What are the total number of genes which affect the patterning of the animal? as opposed to wing color, wing shape, and so on. So can we link the development from the fertilized egg to the adult to the roles of genes? And they did that. And there was another revolution taking place at the same time. And this was the molecular biology revolution, which allowed the isolation of genes in a test tube and asking whether the sequence of genes was similar between one animal and a corresponding gene in another animal, because you could isolate the corresponding gene also in another animal. Then there was another breakthrough in which you could take genes from one animal, modify it, and put it back in the same animal, in flies or mouse, or take a gene from a mouse and put it back into, let's say, put it into flies. But these are very important advances. What this basically has told us, because of evolution being a common thread connected by DNA. DNA is a thread which connects all chemistry. If you isolate a gene from one organism, and you can isolate because of the genetic sequence the homologous gene from another organism, you can ask whether that homologous gene functions in this organism in the same way or not. So these kinds of experiments were done on a very large scale multiple sets of genes. And the result of that is that there are a set of genes which pattern the head, the thorax, and the abdomen of the fly embryo shown here. And they are the same kinds of genes which are involved in patterning the segments in mouse or in human. And this was done by the kinds of experiments which I told you about. So how then does specific tissues actually develop? And we learned a lot from flies, and we learned from mouse, and we learned because of studies in humans, in genetic defects in humans, and all this can be put together. And the basic principles are something very simple, and I'll very briefly tell you that. Look at, unfortunately, this picture is a bit too pixelated. A bit better. So look at the wing of the fly. The wing of a fly, if all of you are cells which give rise to the wing, the wing of the fly are these two parts 
put together like this. So it's just a bilayer of cells. So it's got a front and a back. It's got a top and a bottom. Cells become different very simply by, first of all, proliferating according to the rules which we heard. And everyone, Goldschmidt and Just and Ruse and Grish and Steeman, all of them were right. When cells proliferate, they give rise to daughter cells, and components divide between these two daughter cells. So all of this, she could have started as one cell giving rise to two, giving rise to four, and the cells become different. This property of cells becoming different from each other because of their parentage is called the English model because you are what your parents are. But cells can also influence other cells, neighboring cells. Just like these cells, when put over there, they influence that neighborhood. That's called the American model because you are what, where you live. Your neighborhood is what determines what you become, not where you are born or who your parents were. There's also another property of cells where all cells are equal to each other. And one of them rapidly becomes different by a stochastic event and suppresses all the others from becoming different. And I jokingly and incorrectly, perhaps, call that the Indian model. Now, these three ways result in these cells becoming different from each other. And in the wing, that's exactly what happens. If you just look at the wing blade alone and not at the thorax. So first of all, as the cells divide, there's a rule which says, front and the back are different, and cells from the front and the back don't cross. And that's done by a gene called engraved. Then there's another rule which says top and bottom are different. So that's done by another set of genes and their action. And this combination of inherited action and short and long range signaling patterns these cells in such a manner so that when metamorphosis takes place and they fold, and that's a very important area, you get a wing which has got a anterior and a posterior, a top, a dorsal, and a ventral, and these beautiful patterns over there. Similarly, oops. I think the projector may have gone off. It's okay here. Bulb is gone. Bulb is okay. Well, um, don't worry, I'll carry on. Right. So let's look then at the thorax, the main part of the fly to which the wings are connected. And underlying that are muscles and the nervous system which operate over there. So the rules which make those muscles and the nervous system are also the same kinds of rules which are involved are also the same kinds of rules which are involved in making the wing of the fly. Now I mentioned, now I mentioned that you know, there are rules which say what is the head, what is the thorax, what is the abdomen. Then I told you how one part in the thorax, in the second thoracic segment, the wing develops. So there are intersections, therefore, of rules in development. One, you specify the axis of the entire animal 
what is head, what is thorax, and what is abdomen, and so on. And within each axis, you diversify tissue. In the second thoracic segment, you diversify to make a huge wing. But in the third thoracic segment, a corresponding structure is a very small structure called the halter. So you use the same rules again and again of long range and short range signaling, but you do that in a context dependent manner. And you do that in a context dependent manner also along the time axis. So the intersection of context and time using the same toolkit again and again results in the diversity of animal health. If you change the context and say, I will change T3 to T2, right? So I have two T2s, then instead of getting a small structure like this, you will get, if this moves, you will get a four-winged fly. Sorry about that resolution. you will get a four-wing fly if you change the third segment to the second. So the same toolkit operated previously in the third segment to give rise to a very small structure. And now that you know, you've changed that to the second thoracic segment, it makes what is there in the second, right? Just as when you took this piece of tissue and you put it over there, it reorganized that space to get an entire axis but all the cells in that axis behave according to what segmental rules they were already specified. So that's an important point. So context is important and timing is important. Now this toolkit turns out to be the same toolkit for humans and fly and mouse. It's like saying that if you want to build an airplane, right, you can build a small aircraft or a big, huge Boeing or an Airbus, you need nuts and bolts and screwdrivers and electronics and material. And what you use where and when decides whether you're making a small aircraft or a big one. But the tools and the way you operate them are what are important. But the toolkit itself is same. The principles of flight are the same. And you have to do that in different contexts. And this turns out to be amazingly important. So if you want to study cancer, if you want to study human genetic disorders, you can study any organism and learn a lot about cancer or human biology or any other organism. You can study, because of the shared chemistry, you can study bacteria and learn about the human biochemical pathways. Because of the shared toolkit in making animals, you can study a fish and understand mouse and so on and so forth, or understand human. So this is very important. So the conservation of these toolkits is something very exciting. I've told you about how the outside of an animal is made, but our muscles and our nervous system, again, is made following the same rules. And our laboratory has studied how the inside of the fly, the muscles develop. And I won't have time to go into that. And they also follow exactly the same kinds of rules. Those muscles attach to the outside of the thorax, but they develop, too, by local interactions, short range interactions, long range interactions, and which segment of the animal they are born. Now this is something which is, seems straightforward. You have a particular set of genes, the context decides what to happen. No, so this is a major, no, this is okay, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry. This is a major problem I have, but I want to elaborate on something, I put a blank slide. But the result is that all the IT people think that the projector has broken down. And I also sometimes think the same, but there's actually a blank slide there. <laughs> so I've told you how you can have a set of genes, and that makes an organism, because genes are activated and inactivated in a context-dependent manner. But what, why is it when you have the same set of genes, you get very different appearances in an organism? 
So you can, for example, have twins, identical twins, one who's probably malnourished and the other not, and they will look very different, even though they're identical twins. If one has a particular kind of exposure to a disease, one will respond, and that, will, that could change their development, and the others may not. So these are very important questions. And these questions are being addressed, again, by looking at evolution. Here is an army ant, and these are all the same genotype of army ant. The same, they have the same gene. But each one of them does a very different specialized task. And somehow, the nest is able to regulate the numbers of workers each doing these different kinds of tasks, these specialists, whose body is tuned to specialize in what they do, right? And they are the identical gene. How, how is that happening? And that's an area of very intense investigation because people think this will tell us a lot about genes are regulated, how they're regulated during development. Not only that, amongst this nest, one insect will be chosen sometime during a development to be the queen. And that's the large queen shown over here. And there is a worker positioned on the head of the queen. Again, these two animals have the same identical genotype. They come from the same rest, nest. So these are very exciting areas whose understanding now about how food and nutrition and interactions of various kinds result in dramatic changes in body shape. It's very important in our understanding of obesity, regulation through the insulin pathway, nutrition and its uptake, and many different organisms are going to give us insight about that. Now, there is a last point I'd like to make, and that relates to nature and nurture. This is a ticker tape, as it were, of a Turing computer. And Alan Turing invented the computer which has sufficient memory to compute any problem. And this Turing computer was put in a replicable form by John von Neumann, who also programmed it so that these computers could make themselves. So not only could you have, in theory, a computer which could compute anything, but you could have a computer which replicates itself. Von Neumann also pointed out that in replication, these computers can make mistakes in replication. And people have suggested that these kinds of mistakes are akin to mutations which take place and result in variation. So Turing talked about the computer and computable systems, computable systems, and von Neumann developed the replicated uh, computer and the errors it makes. Now it's all too easy and this man, Erwin Schrodinger, who again was a very complex personality about whom many discoveries have been made recently. But this is in Dublin during the war when he was there and he wrote a book there called What is Life in which he speculated that DNA whose role was discovered about that time, and many exciting work was done. Schrodinger says that the chromosome, where genetic material is, is both builder's craft and architect's plan. Everything to make the organism, he said, was in the DNA. Now, that turns out to be wrong. Everything to build the organism is not in the DNA. The DNA has the code script, but doesn't have the executive function. The executive function on what to turn on when and what to turn off when comes from interactions with the environment. And the environment is a consequence of what the DNA produces as well as the broader environment, as you saw with that. So understanding the executive function and how that impacts on the code script is one of the most exciting and important problems in biology today. And that, the tools to do that have come about very recently at very high resolution. You can take a cell and understand 
and, and delineate all the metabolites, the proteins which are made in a cell. You can ask which genes are expressed and which genes are in an active form or not in an active form and compare it during time. And this combination of deep domain understanding and big data is proving to be extraordinarily valuable in understanding how the diverse forms we see across all of life develop in a time, um, along a timeline and what are the ways by which, what is the algorithm by which the executive function changes and acts upon the genetic material. So this is a very exciting area. I will stop here to say that we have learned a lot initially from a very descriptive sense about how animals develop and all those rules. But we've also learned a lot about the mechanisms which operate. And the beauty of biology is that while there are general principles of cell-cell communication and gene expression I told you about, we need to explore and understand each context to see how the executive function works over there. So there's no general theory of how a fly develops or a human develops. There are general principles by which that development happens. But we need to understand each of those contexts in health and disease. Turing told us a lot about developmental biology as well as computing. Schrodinger, as I said, you know, had very interesting ideas. Uh, the key ones uh, were wrong. Uh, Turing invented the stored program computer. And von Neumann description showed that the description is separate from the constructor. And this is a very important point which I made. This is from Sidney Brenner's uh, work, his quote. So to understand how development takes place, you must choose the light, right level of organism, uh, abstraction. All too often, people descend to genes as everything, and others take a quote-unquote holistic view that somehow looking from the outside, you can figure out everything. There is no escape from genes because they're linked through evolution to everything which happens. But there is no recourse from looking at other levels of activity. And the right level to look at is the machine, the, the cell, because understanding how cells function and interact with other cells is critically important. So thank you very, very much. Those of you who are mathematicians, you'll know that mathematics is the art of perfect. Physics is the art of the optimal, and biology is the art of the satisfactory. So we have to explore all of biology to understand it in a manner which is different from our explorations of physics and mathematics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Vijay Raghavan. An excellent and exciting talk, and all of us really enjoyed it. And I would now request you, if you have some time, to take some questions Certainly, from sir. our students and our faculty members. So, students and uh, faculty members, the floor is yours. So, I would invite one by one question from the students. Okay, that's a mixer. is asking about how this symmetry yeah, yeah, is yeah. maintained. Okay. So the, the question, uh, for those of you who couldn't hear, is how do you have pretty much perfect symmetry between the two halves of an organism? Now, first of all, I should say that there are examples where symmetry is broken. Um, we have many tissues, as do other animals, where they're not two of a kind, but there's only one of a kind. 
So the heart is an example, um, and you know there are other tissues also. Uh, those mechanisms have been studied, but how is symmetry maintained? And that is something which we know at a sort of a descriptive level that each half of the organism, in a manner similar to what Grish's experiment showed, can make an entire organism, but through contact is inhibited from making the entire organism. Then the rules which say what is the first segment, the second segment, the third segment, apply to both these halves, which are otherwise identical. The only rule which keeps that symmetry is that these two cannot cross each other. Right? And then you make what is one organism, and you make the other organism, and you make connecting parameters, which also have their rules about what can go across and what are not. Then you got, know this quite a lot in animals which have a good symmetry. We are learning about this in situations where symmetry is not maintained, and how you can get massive asymmetric development. There are some animals, such as crabs, where one limb will develop very huge and the other will not. Uh, so the rules of how they can be broken are also broken. Student, would I have a Sir, it's a wonderful. After that. Uh, sir, it's a wonderful uh, presentation. This is a librarian here. Uh, uh, last 4.5 billion years, we have developed a lot of these stages in the art. So what would be the predictions after 20? I, where are you? I'm, I'm here. Ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, what is the question? Yeah. I said that uh, uh, we have seen the lot of the, uh, the development last 4.5 billion years in the earth. So what would be the predictions after 25,000 years? Well, I don't know about 25,000 years, but things look at changing at a dramatic pace over the next few decades because of the vagaries due to climate change, environmental issues, sustainable development. There's a lot which needs to be done immediately. And similarly, with the development of technologies such as genetic engineering and artificial intelligence, there's a lot to be asked about how human agency can be maintained in the context of these technologies. So that's an area which is very, very important. Um. Right, right. So the question is that um, I mentioned a way by which cells have their daughter cells both get identical components, and the other in which one can get one and the other not, and what are the rules? Those rules have been studied really nicely, uh, particularly you know, in one area where they have studied well is in the way stem cells proliferate. Stem cells give rise to more stem cells, and typically they do that by having one stem cell, dividing to give rise to another stem cell, and another daughter, which then differentiates into, let's say, a nerve cell. So this is asymmetric division. And that is regulated by a set of gene products, which well, some of them are Prospero or NUM, which are localized in diff whose RNA and protein product are localized by cellular localization components into one side of the cell and not on the other. And therefore, they, then they reach. Uh, they go asymmetrically. And this is done by another gene uh, product called notch. So the pathway by which asymmetric division takes place is known. By abrogating that asymmetric mechanism, you by not having these gene products I told you about acting to make the cell, the mother cell asymmetric, the mother cell is symmetric and the daughter gets both the same. So that's very well studied. Good morning, sir. There's, Jaydeep, there are also people in the front. Yeah. My name is Bert Matthews, sir. 
the key to develop as we between each cell so deciding their future fate so if we can somehow formulate or uh, decipher the pattern of the signaling so is it to our own fate I didn't hear the last sentence of what you said. Uh, sir, Yeah. So the question is that if cell-cell interactions are critically important for the fate of their daughter cell, is there some way to program this fate so that, you know, you get different end products? Dr. Mishra mentioned the digits in the hand. Instead of having these digits which are different from each other, can you have five thumbs instead? Uh, and the answer is yes, there are both naturally occurring mutations which do that. But since we know the cellular factors and the signaling mechanisms which give rise to that, people have made these differences, programmed these differences in flies and mouse, for example. You saw, saw the four-winged fly I showed you. That's a result of effectively programming it by making mutants. So you can make these changes both to break the kinds of symmetries which we heard about, also to generate new kinds of structures. So, sir, till uh, which stage can uh, organisms that we derive from embryos, like uh, we saw for two cell stage, where each, uh, each cell was able to create an entirely different organism in this scenario, uh, how long is this situation maintained, as in like 16 cells or 32 cells, is it lost, if, when, when? So, the question is, um, I told you about Hans Driesch's experiments where you divide a two cell stage embryo, separate them, and it makes an entire organism. Till what stage can you keep doing that? Can you do it at the four cell stage, at the eight cell stage, at the 16 cell? It varies from organism to organism. It can, it's different from mouse and human. It depends on the context and so on. But a very interesting point to keep in mind is the experiment which was done to create Dolly the sheep, which was to take the nucleus from a fully differentiated cell and put it into an early embryo. And that resulted in the entire organism being made. So the genome of the organism has the capacity to make the entire organism, but it's a cellular milieu which decides how much of a restriction there is. Now, while there is a restriction, what Shinya Yamanaka and colleagues showed is that by modulating, like this gentleman asked, the expression of specific factors, you can reprogram a differentiated cell to have this capacity to make an entire organ. There was this man here, Jaydeep, uh, before that. Yeah. And then Chalvi. You can ask me, I'll, I'll repeat. Yeah. So the question is, um, I talked about transplantation of cells from one part of an embryo to another part of another embryo of the same animal, and that programmed that second embryo to have two axes to a two-headed embryo. So the question is, if you were to take this from one species and put it to another, will it have an effect? The answer is in some cases, yes. If the animals are related, the reason is that the molecular mechanism of the signaling is conserved. So by putting it elsewhere, you will have that molecular impact in the organism. The point is, that those cells from one organism don't create tissue of another organism, but they reprogram that organism to do other things. 
right? Now, his question is, can you make a chimera, for example, of a wing, a chicken with a mouse, to have a mouse with a wing? The answer, those kinds of experiments have been done within chicken, right? And within chicken and other birds. So chickens have wings dorsally and they have legs ventrally, right? So you can ask if you transplant the cells which will make this limb, which is modified, which is the wing, if you transplant them to the region of the leg, will it make an extra wing or will it make an extra leg? And the answer is it depends when you do the transplantation, right? It knows that it has to make a limb. That's a fairly early decision. So it will make a leg if you transplant that early. But if you transplant late after the wingness has been decided, it will continue to make a wing. Now, you don't do hybrids between human and chicken or between chicken and mouse because they develop chicken and mouse Human would not be ethical. Chicken and mouse, even if you try, those kinds of rules and the differentiation parameters are very different, so that will be a mess for the experiment. Uh, like, like, sir, I have a question. Uh, sir, I have a question. Like, say if we, uh, okay. so like if we are using, like, uh, in case of the Pyrenees ibex and the, uh, the Iberian ibex, so we did a crossbreeding between them, like, the Pyrenees ibex is extinct now, and Iberis ex, uh, ibex is currently available. So we just did an experiment by taking, by denucleating the stem cell of the Iberian ibex, and instead of that, we just put the so the, for the 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 cells from uh, the Pyrenees ibex, and we got a uh, clone some cell, some sort of structure. So is it possible in case of other organisms also? So let me try to interpret that question. The point is that. If you have DNA from one organism and that organism is extinct, but you have intact DNA available, can you take that entire genetic material and put it into a cell of a closely related organism and then get back, revive that organism? Well, point is that there are lots of arguments about how this might happen or not happen, <coughs> but unless the experiment is done in each case, you don't know the answer. There are lots of complications like I've told you about, for example, with the ant or human development, how important the cytoplasm and the membrane is. Those properties are specialized, so it depends on the nature of that. But people have tried this in many related contexts, but not you know, as a general rule, we don't know. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, uh, or it is lagging behind because uh, it lag, like me that. Uh, you know, Nobel Prize in 1920, and it is now more than a century, but we cannot get an advanced process and a Havers process. So there are another processes like Coleg and uh, Halder Topsy processes, but they are only changing the uh, like catalyst from iron to ruthenium or osmium to get a better uh, catalytic uh, um, the, Just think about at that time, they are produ they, they produce a, that process that that is not uh, like uh, as compared to these processes that is very uh, advanced so uh, whether my question is that uh, you are not getting uh, like uh, producing a new process better than uh, a, a traditional process so, so why the question is, is about specifically but the general question is about is science moving ahead or not? And the example given was the Haber process, which you argue is not improved upon since 100 years. 
but there's a very beautiful book it's called the alchemy of air which you should read and that's about the history of the haber process and how many people were trying to develop something equal into that and how haber and roche succeeded so you i could invert your question why wasn't the haber process invented 5 10 15 20 years before it was it was not invented not because of any limitations in chemistry but it was not invented because it didn't have the coming together of a major requirement to capture nitrogen from the air because the need for fertilizers and bosch was related to an industry family and haber was a chemist came together to do this on a pilot scale as opposed to a laboratory so there have been extraordinary advances in chemistry there may not have been a economic pressure or a social pressure till recently which is there now to modify something which is working well you have invented the wheel thousands of years ago the wheel was invented thousands of years ago why don't we have a better design for the wheel because the design which is invented a circle, <coughs> a circle works very well and a square or an ellipse doesn't work that well but there have been all sorts of other modifications to the wheel which allow it to function better and the same is true of the haber process in terms of tuning a factory and how it works the fundamental process has been modified many times depending on the energy source the boundary condition the effluent and so on Uh, we are running out of time, and we will have no, one or two questions. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, if I could bring a question. I have just a general question. When it comes to biology, uh, the first principle, uh, the first principle that anyone asked me to say, like the cell theory, like the cell has the chromosome, So, man, could any of the minute cells actually become molecules? Suppose the molecule has to be. No, no, you can. I'll come closer. Yeah, supposing. Like someone is doing that. He or she is finding that a certain molecule X is involved in certain set of functions. Then another paper comes in and they find. different kind of things. so in this kind of dynamicity how we can have a proper diagnostic or molecular surfacing because when it comes to very minute cells there are lot of hypothesis lot that is the basic theory that we all so this is a very important question and that relates to the point that if you look at a particular process let's say how the finger is made you find a set of molecules which are involved in making the finger now someone else is looking at how the blood system develops and they find a overlap in the kinds of molecules between how the finger is made and how the blood is made right and then when you're trying to treat a blood disease with a particular drug by inhibiting or activating a particular molecule then that drug also affects the finger and develops so how are we going to deal with it now the it's not a problem but the fact is that as i said just as all biology shares evolutionary links and a shared chemistry all the cells in our body also share chemistry with the fertilized egg and going forward the executive function uses the same components the same toolkit again and again in different ways and because the restrictions and progressive restrictions in development this allows you to implement an executive function and a toolkit in one context and result in a finger and have in another context because that is already been separated out having a shared executive function and a shared toolkit to do something dramatically different that's why you find nuts and bolts and screwdrivers everywhere right because they are used everywhere 
Now, if you find a screw which has gone bad over here and you have an antidote to a bad screw, it will also affect all the bad screws elsewhere because you're putting the drug in the whole organism. So a big challenge in treatment and drug delivery is to ensure that your delivery takes place in a local context and not in a general context. But you're going to find this again and again. There is no rule which says you can't do that. That's the nature of biology. Please, please go ahead. Go ahead. Ask your question. In school, we learn that organisms acquire characters. Which is in response to adverse environmental conditions, the is thought that mutation do not lead to a particular What is the So the question is that uh, he says that in school they were taught that organisms adapt to the environment through selection. If the environment changes, those animals, plants, organisms which carry mutations, which allow them to survive better in that changed environment, they proliferate and the others go away. But this has been called survival of the fittest. Now, so what is your question then? They're non-directional. So, so this is a, no, the classic answer to that is the Luria-Delbruck fluctuation test, which you will learn in biology, which showed that mutations are present randomly in a population, and they are not directional, and they will not have Many of them will not have consequence. Some of them will be deleterious. Some of them will have no consequence. And some of them potentially could be advantageous should the environment change. Now, when the environment changes, say, by putting an antibiotic, right, then those mutations which confer antibiotic resistance, which happen to be there, those cells will survive and grow. So that is the classical view. Last, this is the last question. But there are lots of variations on that we can talk about. There's one person here, Jaydeep, in the uh, front row. Go ahead. So the question is, I said two apparently contradictory things. One, that if you have a gene in one organism, let us say in the mouse, which makes the thorax of the mouse, and that gene, if put into a fruit fly, will make the thorax of the fruit fly, then I also mentioned that the environment matters in how genes are expressed, then how is it that these two genes function in the same way? And this is a very important question. Now this comes from, this problem comes from my loose use of the term gene. Now the genes have two parts, one broadly a regulatory part, and the other a part which codes for a protein. If I take the part which codes for a protein, say this part which makes a digit or a part of the animal, and I take this part which codes and I put it under a regulatory element which is expressed everywhere, right? Then what will happen essentially at a first approximation, I will get a thorax all across this body. 
So I'm forcing the expression of a thoracic gene from mouse to be expressed in a fly, and I'm getting a ectopic thorax. So I can make a gene which makes an eye, for example, which is it's top of the hierarchy of regulating eye development in human, and put it all across the body of a fly, and get fly eyes all across the body of the fly. So this is not using the same regulatory element of the human gene. Now, just as genes which encode proteins function the same way across organisms, in a cell, they regulate other proteins. Do regulatory elements, are they also conserved, right? Are the regulatory elements which express the thoracic gene in the thorax conserved with the regulatory element which expresses thoracic genes in the fly? Because the expression pattern of these genes are very similar, thorax here, thorax here. The answer to that, we suspect Yes, but the mechanism of this conservation we don't know in detail and we don't know how. So just putting the regulatory element of a mouse into that of a fly messes things up. So the executive function in the fly is a product of the fly's environment and the executive function in the mouse is the product of the mouse environment. Both of them restrict the thoracic gene expression to a particular Yeah, this is the last question. Go ahead, please. You can, you can speak without mind. So the question is that if you look at um, entropy in physics and chemistry, Entropy is increasing, but in biology it seems to be decreasing. Put another way, how, do, how is it that you can get order in biology, right, uh, and not everything degenerating into disorder? How is order maintained in life? The answer to that is it doesn't come free. You need energy through our food, plants through photosynthesis and elsewhere to basically constantly battle against entropy, right? So this is a system which is not completely closed. It will degenerate into high entropy, right? It is not an open system which will go into high entropy if there's no source of energy, but it's a system where energy is taken and put into a closed system, but there's an interaction with the outside to get energy. So the outside is critically important, both for development and also for information. Thank you, thank you, sir, for, for the interactions and allowing our students. Thank Give you. a big hand. Okay. So let me now request our director, Professor Jogendra Sharma, to give a token of memento and our appreciation to Professor Vijay Raghavan. My dear students, you know how many questions everyone was asking. I want to make, a, make an announcement here. Professor Vijay Raghavan has accepted to teach a course to you, and he is going to be a distinguished faculty at I. Sarvarampur. Clap for him. He will, he will be here again for you all to have a course and he will spend time here and the course will also be relayed to the nicer students together and maybe to the other students wherever we will collect, connect here to that one. Thank you to Professor Vijay Raghavan and to the students here. Thank you very much. Refreshment at the back end. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.